So this is the eve of 2024 and uh, I felt the message this week would be good is called the unfettered life. And depends how old you are, depends whether you even know what that word means, I guess. But we'll get into that eventually. You know when you, uh, when you're lost as a guy, you're driving around, you're lost. Occasionally you'll get out of the car and just kind of look around and try to get your bearings straight. And here we are. We're December 31st. We're at the highest point of the year, really, when you get it, get to it. And we have an opportunity to do what Bob said. We're looking back and going, wow, look at the last year. Look at the miracles that have happened, actually. We went from not knowing what would happen, if anything would happen, and God has opened doors with the, with the government. The curiosity in the community, I know, is big time. And you know what, as long as, as long as we stay the course, you know what, people will start trusting us. And why should they trust us if all we say is trust me? You don't know me yet, don't trust me yet. Trust me when you have a reason to trust me. And so I, I don't mind when people are a little hesitant because they have that right. And they have the brains actually that are smart enough to figure that out. Well, another thing that might be a good thing to do on December 31st would be to give ourselves a mental wellness check. <laughs> and mind, that was a very short list I went through and went, no, you're not right. You're not right, bro. You still got a ways to go. You ask yourself, how did I do this last year? And how are things looking coming into this new year? Christmas has just slipped right on by. Families packed up and gone back to their various homes and locations. This is a great time of year to sit back and to slump into a nice post-Christmas, say it, you're thinking it, depression. <laughs> <laughs> or take some time to review Reevaluate and readjust. A man in the Bible lived during a time when pagan worship, idol worship, was rampant. He was a political assistant to a very popular leader. A leader who was about to die and leave it all into his hands. You know what? There's a big difference between being the guy and being the guy's assistant. That can be a big pressure when someone says, guess what? You're going to be the guy now. The man had served under, had been given a revelation. God spoke to the guy and said, guess what? You're going to die. So get your house in order. Prepare this servant, your assistant, to be the leader now. Because this isn't a debate. You are going to die. This leader of prestige and influence was none other than, anyone want to guess? Take a stab at a thousand pages. <laughs> it was Moses. And God had told him that you would soon die and Joshua would take your place. Joshua was virtually an unheard of person up to this point. When God told Moses, you are going to die, it was at a high point. It might have been December 31st because they were at the brink of huge change. They had spent 40 years of pain and wandering in the desert because of what? Their unbelief. Now they are at the finish line. They can see the promised land. They could look back at where they had come from, Egypt, from the land of slavery, from the land of bondage. They had been there 430 years. 
They could see where they had come from and they could also see the promise they were pursuing. I think it's okay for us to sometimes stop, turn around and take a look. Where have we come from? Not lament or wish for those days again, but to understand why we never wish to go there ever again. Joshua, an unknown, was feeling the weight of the responsibility of a leader, and he could see the multitude of eyes that were looking at him. Hey, what are you going to do? We're ready. And he's standing there. This is pretty big. <laughs> Joshua made a very interesting address to the people. And it shows you the character of a born again believer. He said in Joshua 24, 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He was at the pinnacle of his life. And he said, I've made a calculation. I've looked around. I've looked back, I've looked forward. One thing I'm sure of, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Joshua could have chosen fear. He could have chosen to sit down and be overwhelmed and overcome by the weight of responsibility that had been placed on his shoulders. Couldn't it be? Of course he could have. That was a huge shift in his job, in his career. But he said, as for me and my family, we've established this. We're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua was a very practical guy. He realized that not everyone was going to be wanting to follow the Lord. So he said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. Now, John Wayne wasn't there, but he had a saying that I thought was interesting. In a lot of his movies, he'd go, hey, pilgrim. And you know what? A pilgrim is someone who is on a journey. They are not at home. They are not where they want to be. They're on a pilgrimage to their promised land the same as the children of Israel were. They were on a pilgrim, pilgrimage. And in order to not wander aimlessly on our pilgrimage, it is prudent to occasionally stop, look back, and assess our progress in our journey. Some have come to the end of 2023 completely exhausted, tired, weighed down, and ready to quit or take a serious break. Life has been heavy. We need to look back and see, especially if we are beaten down. This is where the unfettered part comes in. What am I dragging along that is wearing me out? I think that's the key question. What am I dragging along that is wearing me out? Do I have excess baggage that I could just let go of that is stealing my joy and mental health? Many things in life will try to catch a free ride at your expense. Hey, pilgrim, choose this day. The Bible says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to steal kill, and destroy. The demonic realm is a bunch of what? Fallen angels that are under the command of Satan, a fallen angel, not a God, a fallen angel. 
Satan is an angel that was thrown out of heaven. He didn't leave heaven. He was thrown out of heaven. He was cast out of heaven. We, we give him a little bit more credence than he probably should get. He was chucked out of heaven. <laughs> he now is a bitter little foe that is bent on seeking glory for himself. We call it small man syndrome. Well, that's in the Greek, but whatever. <laughs> he dispatches other demonic spirits to seek out weaknesses and traits in families that they can leech onto for generations under the guise of that's just how our family is. Right? On the eve of 2024, you have a very unique opportunity to look back and cut loose these ties that may be tormenting and holding you back from experiencing God's full life. Depression is a leech that wants to keep you from living in the joy of the Lord, which is also, by the way, your strength. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joshua had a reason to be depressed and overwhelmed by life. His mentor, his friend, and the leader of Israel had passed away. And the weight of that responsibility now all laid on his shoulders. And he responded to that pressure by saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I have made a calculation. I have made an assessment. And I have taken action to implement my desires. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Another way of saying it might have sounded like this. I have cut soul ties with fear. I have cut soul ties with depression. I have acknowledged my tendencies and weaknesses and therefore I commit myself and my whole family into the care of the Lord. Sometimes we need to be desperately honest. You know what, I, I could share, I thought about this, I could share some personal stories of demonic leeches that have been assigned to my family, to my family's bloodline, of which I have had to wrestle and ask for strength from God, wisdom from God, and the Lord, how to deal with these things. But then I thought, I don't actually want to put them on display and give them glory. So I won't address them specifically. But I think enough said. We need to, in the privacy of our homes, or in the privacy of our own spirit, acknowledge, separate, and destroy there's things that have come into your family history, family lineage that we have not dealt with because we thought they were normal. They're not normal. We've just allowed them to tag along like a bloodsucker sucking the life right out of us. Number one thing in cutting demonic leeches is you must call them out. A lot of times we don't call them out because we say, well, I've heard it. I played in Halifax once at a prison and I, I met a young guy in there and I just, it blew me away. I was like, what are you doing in here, man? This was a, this was a hardcore prison. I think it was, it was, a, it was there were huge guys. It was like a long-term prison for hardened criminals. There was a young guy in there and I said, what are you doing here, man? And he looked at me and said, my dad was in prison, I'm in prison. I thought, Buddy, you had a choice. You don't have to end up like this. You don't have to choose this path. You know what, we need to call them out and let them know they are not welcome in our home. A lot of times people will be under a demonic attack, under heavy depression, 
And then when you go through their house, you're gonna find all kinds of occultic symbols and paraphernalia. You know what that's called? It's called welcome in. You know what? We need to clean the temple, which is our body, number one, which would mean the battle is mostly here. But we also need to clean our earthly temple and make sure we don't have anything that are conjuring up or welcoming things into our home that shouldn't be there. You must cover your home and family with what? The blood of Jesus Christ. You know, what do we sing today? We ain't got nothing. I come with nothing, God. I need you to cover my life with your blood, your sanctifying, cleansing, freeing blood. Because I brought nothing to the table. I had nothing to bring. John Wayne had another nice quote that I like. A big mouth doesn't make a big man. <laughs> and the devil's got a big mouth. <laughs> but he ain't a big man. As you call out and take authority over these generational leeches. Oh, interesting. The word authority never crossed some of our minds. Yes, in Jesus Christ, you have the authority to call these things out that have had a heyday tormenting your family tree. And the, and the nice thing is, you don't have to yell, you don't have to chant, you don't have to scream, you don't have to operate in fear or in hysteria. This is the truth. It is through a quiet submission that you present yourself and your family to the Lord and allow Him to remove the undesirables from your family. It is not you, it's Christ that does the work. Do you know why mental illness is a, is a huge thing? Because it's founded in fear. It's founded in, I need to cure myself, but I can't cure myself. If it's Christ that frees us and not ourselves, lest anyone should boast. Oh, that sounds like a scripture. Oh yeah, it is. God has said, take the weight off your shoulders, apply the freedom that is found in my finished work. Your family, your life, your mind doesn't have to be sucked dry by generational demonic spirits that have said we have a right to this home. But it, you know what, it takes being honest. It takes acknowledging it. And I remember I shared a few times some of the personal things that have happened to me and people looked at me like, that's a bit too much. You shouldn't be saying that. And I thought, you know what, like it or lump it. You know what, the truth isn't pretty. Sometimes the truth is actually embarrassing. The truth isn't sophisticated sometimes because the truth reveals the dirty secrets that the family has allowed to tag along. I've had to deal with some really weird things. Did I invite them into my home? No. But through bloodline connection, they felt they had the right to come into my home. And I had to stand up and say, as for me and my house, you ain't coming in here. I'm gonna deal with this because I don't want my kids to have to deal with it. I'm gonna break the chains right here. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, hmm, if my grandmother was a prostitute, my father was a drunken alcoholic, my father abused my mother, my cousins were involved in witchcraft. Do you think there's anything in the bloodline? Is there anything? No, we're good. I'm good. I live down the road there. I got a nice little lake ridge. Everything's good. What's not seen? What's the heavy weight that's keeping the joy of the Lord from being manifest in our life? And when we start asking these questions from a higher level point where we can actually see broader all of a sudden we see, hold it, that little sap sucker's still there. 
I need to shoot that thing before it grows. A lot of people are familiar with spring cleaning. When you go through their garage or their house or maybe even their shed, and they look at all this stuff and they organize everything and some of the things you, I don't even bother because I got way too much junk, but some people that are organized go through their garages, their sheds, and they go, what did I ever get this for? Chuck it out. Or they have a spot for it that they, I might need it. But a lot of it, they sent to Goodwill or the thrift service. I don't know why I even bought that. And sometimes we have to look at the junk we've accumulated. Why did I ever get that? This eve before the new year, we too should look in the closet and see what we have allowed to be part of our lives. And John Wayne says, hey, pilgrim, what you dragging along? <laughs> Pilgrimage is long. Why are you dragging that weight? Why have you allowed that leech to continue tormenting? You know what? Some people have to look guilt in the face, bitterness in the face, brokenness in the face, resentment in the face, anxiety in the face, lust in the face, lawlessness in the face, and say in the name of Jesus, you have no place here with me and my house. I am a pilgrim heading to the promised land. Joshua was going to possess the land of what? The promised land. God said, I am going to lead you to the promised land. The land of milk and honey, dude. That's like the first time the kids ever walk into a McDonald's. So... <laughs> There's a slide in here. Who would have ever guessed? What a genius. And a Happy Meal. I can feel good every day now. I can slide and eat my Happy Meal. Well, God said, I'm, I'm bringing you to that place. That honey and milk. Why, you have to ask yourself, why? <laughs> why did Joshua have to say, are you in or out? Why? <laughs> like any sane person should have been, I'm in. You shouldn't have to even ask. It's so obvious. It would be, yeah, of course. But Joshua was a very practical guy. He said, some of you can't seem to get Egypt out of you. You've allowed that distasteful lifestyle to drag along. The land of God's provision, grace, abundance, security, and acceptance. What kind of no-brainer question is that? Are you in? They should have all been there at the finish line saying, us too. And sometimes the enemy has so leached onto our family tree that we actually believe we're just getting what we deserve. And it's okay. He has convinced us this is who we are. You ever heard that? People say, this is who we are. This is our culture. This is what we do. And I'm like, you don't want to know where my culture, because I think I trace it back to a cannibal tribe. <laughs> and you looking good right about now. <laughs> you know, that statement makes about as much sense as I won't give any illustrations because they could be incriminating. Jesus Christ understands our predicament. He understands and knows the ability of Satan, the master liar. What did Jesus say himself? He said, when you speak, you speak your native tongue. Because you're a liar like your father, the devil. Jesus said, when you become my child, you get to sit on my lap and I bounce you around like a happy little baby. No, no, that's the way I would have written the story. 
He says, anyone want to take a stab in the dark or you're too scared? Jesus said, if you will become my child, you will have to die. Your old ways of thinking will have to go bye-bye. You will need my life in you. And guess what it will produce? Galatians 5, 22. Love, joy, peace, patience, next week, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How much of that did I produce? Nothing. Not one thing. Jesus said, when you become my child, you will have to die. You will have to leave all of the old leeches behind, bury them. And then I'm gonna give you my life. And from my life, you will all of a sudden understand what real love is, what real joy is, what real peace is. You'll be amazed at how patient you are because you know you are not that person. <laughs> the kind of freedom and power that Christ wants to manifest in our life in 2024 cannot operate in conjunction with the enemy. I read a quote, and I have to read it because it was awesome. <laughs> you can't defeat your demons if you're still enjoying their company. <laughs> you know what? That's where the honesty thing comes, and I'm glad I'm not a priest because so, I don't want to hear it. We should be honest before God and say, God, what have I actually been okay with? Which leech actually is kind of my pet, my buddy? I got some in the closet that I have to beat down. I love when I was in Bible school. One of the teachers, he was ex-military. The guy scared the crap out of me. The guy said, he's preaching in Romans. He says, you need to reckon the old man dead. Because if you don't, in the Greek, it literally comes back to life. <laughs> I was like, okay, dude, easy, easy, man, easy. Whatever. And you know what? We need to be that real. We need to say, God, I don't need to broadcast this to everyone. I need to be honest with myself because I want to live a life of freedom, blessing, joy, contentment. So then we just say, you know what? Is there anything in my life that I've allowed to carry, to suck onto me that sucks my life out? And I even know it. But it's, if we enjoy the company still, we won't deal with it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Ooh, again, I didn't create this. I didn't make it. I didn't invent it. God said, here it is. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What's better than your wife? Someone else's. What do you do when you know you're a pig of a man? You build a fence. And you train yourself. You take authority. What do you do when you read romance novels and you're dreaming about another man and not your man? <laughs> well, you either cater to it or you don't. Oh, interesting. Sam, why did you leave those illustrations out for another day? <laughs> we all have things that we cater to that it's the eve of a new year, of a new life that we need to assess. No one makes anyone do nothing. It's a free country. You can do whatever you want. But we have, the, we have the obligation to ourselves to say, if I want to live free and unfettered, 
what would that entail? And how would it look? And all of a sudden, the principles of the Bible start blasting loud and clear. Number one, acknowledge. Understand that Satan is playing for keeps. The battle is real. Number two, annihilate. Any thoughts that are degrading you as a child of God, remove. Any demonic association that is in your life or home, destroy. Number three, accept the fact that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been absolved of the guilt of your past and you are no longer under the accu accusations of the enemy. You know what, how many people that have said, oh, Jesus, forgive me, still live with the guilt of their actions from before? I'm like, did he forgive you or didn't he? You don't believe him? He forgave you, it's okay, let it go. <laughs> he already forgot about it, you won't let it go. It's like... You know what? I've done things. I said, God, forgive me. But then the devil comes along a few months later. Hey, Sam, wake up. Remember? You are sick. You are sick. And I'm like, on a bad day, I'm like, you're right. On a good day, I'm like, get lost. Your breath stinks. Know your place. Know you're accepted. Number four, approach. The Bible says, do not be afraid to come into the presence of God. That is where the healing begins. Why do you think the enemy wants us to carry these things? Because it keeps us away from the presence of God. Because we carry a shadow of guilt with us all the time. And that means we don't want to approach God because we feel guilty. Adam and Eve, what did they do when they were guilty? ran and hid. You are free to live an unfettered life. You do not need to allow the sins of your past or the sins of your parents serve as weights that you must carry into 2024. You are free as a child of God. I am a free man in Christ. You are a free woman in Christ. Acts 4.13 the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. That reminds me of a song off of, what was that show? I've had no formal tra training. That, uh, she bye, she bye, she moved, she moved. William Hong, that's it. <laughs> I had no formal training. You're kidding. <laughs> this isn't like that. <laughs> the people could see John and Peter were just average dudes. They had no training. How are they so powerful and bold in their speech? Oh, here it is. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Wow, when you've been in the presence of God, when you've walked with the master, he removes a lot of those leeches. You know what I'm trying to do? Avoid the long version that a lot of us take. Years and years of living under a heavy weight that wasn't mine or yours to carry. I lived with guilt that wasn't my guilt. I had given it to God, but the enemy convinced me to carry it, to take it again and pick it up and walk with it. You know what? What am I? You know, people say, oh, you're from the Ukraine. You're this, you're that. I say, I'm a Canadian. You know what I got to say? I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. John and Peter had this freedom from the past, free from the fetters of regret. Regret can be such a huge leech. They were free from that. 
free from self-consciousness to Christ-empowered boldness. Free to say it. He saved me. I was tied down, beaten up, and he saved me, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Free of sin's grip to reign in me. I am free. Maybe that might be the practice we need to do. You get up in the morning, same as the movie, What About Bob? I feel great. I feel good. I feel wonderful. Well, maybe you need to get up in the morning and say, I'm free of sin. Just hopefully you don't have that mental image of What About Bob in your head. It probably will. <laughs> free to move. I have the life of Christ in me. I am free to move forward with my family into the promises that God has said are mine in his name. Here's a little mental image to keep with you. When you see these huge ships, I looked this up on Google, so I know it's got to be true. <laughs> you see these huge ships, some of them have 20 levels. That's a fact. I didn't even go with the longest one, but some of them are over a thousand feet long. One that I looked at had a capacity of 7,000 guests, plus over 2,000 workers. We're talking a ship here, this is no little day. It can endure huge waves, carry immense loads, and yet it is held in port by a little rope. Think about that. What would our potential be if we cut loose some of these leeches? Christ has come to reveal the liberating power of the gospel in our lives through the working of the Holy Spirit. Religion preaches self-righteousness. Christianity preaches Christ's life living in me. Because... I got way too many brain cells working to think that I can attain God's status. I know I can't. That's why Jesus said, you got to die and you let my life in you. Otherwise, you got a nice another version of religion ruling and weighing you down. You know what? We want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't manifest the Holy Spirit. That's not, I don't have that in my bag of tricks. They didn't train me about that in Bible school. You know what? He's sovereign. He will act when he acts and how he wants to act. His biggest message to each one of us, though, is we can be free. I have come to set you free. Oh, it sounds so complicated. What does he mean by free? <laughs> Don't let a lie of the enemy hold you back from your destiny. Remember that friend that you had? And we probably all had one of these friends. They were there to actually drag you down. They actually put you down. They were there more than willing to confirm your doubts about yourself. Why did they do it? I thought they were my friend. And these leeches sometimes pretend they're our friends. You know why? They were jealous and intimidated by you. So their resource was to beat you down. The enemy, think about it. Where was Satan? Where was he originally? Oh yeah, heaven. He knows what awaits each child of God. Of course he's jealous. Because he knows where he's going. When we start connecting the dots and the picture starts becoming more clear and clear, all of a sudden you say, mm -hmm. why, why have I been so stupid? Satan knows his days are numbered. He is trying a last ditch effort to tie God's children up under a load of lies, burdens and deceptions that will keep you from experiencing the freedom that Christ gave his life for you to enjoy. Christ's purposes and plans are only 
good for you. You can't find anything else in the Bible. You can't find it because it ain't there. The question he's asking each one of us is this. Will we let a little lie keep us from all that Christ has for us? May we start today living unfettered lives, free from the scares, the sneering looks, and trappings of the enemy. You know what? We sing a song, Jesus is more than enough. Remember that song? <laughs> more than enough. Well, that sounds terrible, actually. That's only true when we allow him to cut the ropes and lies that the enemy has told us are part of who we are. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. There you go. You know what? I want to encourage each one here to go out and live 2024 as free men, women, and children. Why? Because you are a child of God. He has a seal on your life. We have to be going against our nature to not live in it. So Lord, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are constantly opening our eyes and minds and hearts to receive truth, that your Holy Spirit makes our hard-hearted default soft and pliable, that by your Holy Spirit you reveal that we are loved, we are cherished, we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. And all you want is us to enjoy your presence and to walk in freedom and to see your handiwork, to see how you will open the sea before us that seems impossible to cross. And you're saying, trust me today, it's only the beginning. So Lord, we thank you for the joy of the Lord that we don't have to walk and live in guilt, but we can live in the freedom and peace and joy of the Lord. In your name we pray, amen.